speaker is Matthew Burke. Um, Matt completed his PhD in, as part of the first cohort in our Economics for the Anthropocene project at McGill University. And we were, were lucky to recruit him um, back to Vermont to be a postdoc in our Leadership for the Ecozoic project at the University of Vermont. Uh, his position is, is both in the Rubenstein School of Environment and Natural Resources as well as the Gunn Institute for Environment. And Matt is uh, taking the lead on getting a, a new policy lab off the ground um, where we're gonna be trying to work with our grad students to translate research into policy proposals. And Matt uh, is gonna talk to us more about the energy transition side of things. Matt, and he does not have slides, which is, which is kind of cool. So Matt, take it away. Thanks, John. Thanks, Ursula, uh, Meg, Leah, nice to see you and be here with you. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay. <clears throat> so also thanks to Rubenstein School and the Gund Institute, and of course the L4E community. Um, so I'm, I want to bring this idea of energy sufficiency to our discussion today. And uh, as a way of starting, I'd just like to ask the folks joining this call, if you could just pop something in the chat, whatever comes to mind when you think of sufficiency. Um, it could be a, a single word or a phrase just to kind of get things going. And I'll wait just a moment. <laughs> nice. Enough relaxation, plenty. Cooperation, provisioning. <laughs> Plump, nice, all right, well-being, good. Safety, great. Needs met, you can keep going with that. Um, and I'll just get started here. So this idea of energy sufficiency <clears throat> here is very much about how much energy is, is enough. Um, and I'm speaking here in terms of this uh, discourse and the conversation and the drive to transition to renewable energy. So this is within that context and specifically among calls for a just transition. So energy sufficiency is asking us to think about what level does increasing energy use no longer relate to improvements in, in human well-being, effectively shifting from enough energy to too much. And you can see in some of the uh, uh, ideas that people are putting into the chat, there's, there's a notion of a minimum and the sufficient amount, which is really what energy access is all about. And then there's a notion of maximum, which is not getting the, the, uh, the type of attention that it needs. So my purpose here is to show there is a need for and a way to recognize maximum energy targets, and then also to advance this idea of energy sufficiency, both conceptually or conceptually, theoretically, and the methods. Um, in this context of a just renewable energy transition. So why would we care about um, energy sufficiency? Well, first, I think just to counter this growthism that frames uh, renewable energy transition, and specifically thinking about the decoupling um, arguments between energy use and economic growth, this has not been substantiated in any meaningful way over the long term. And then more generally, there's a technical bias in both the research and practice of energy transition. And uh, I, th I think, I hope, we're, we may be getting beyond this notion that the technology will save us. Um, but we, this needs to involve a shift to consider the underlying need and the purpose for modern energy systems. And we need a, a space, really, to have those types of discussions, especially given the extreme inequalities in energy use and the unavoidable harms associated with any industrial energy source. So I'm suggesting that criteria for renewable energy transition should not be growth, but rather the satisfaction of well-being. And the starting point for energy sufficiency requires attention to human needs and well-being rather than the energy technologies. So what I want to do um, to begin, just to provide some background to what we know about this relationship between energy use and well-being. Let me see if I can do this in a way that I can see it. Okay, so 
I'm going to steal or borrow an idea from Kate Rayworth. So this is our saturation curve, if you can see that. <clears throat> there it is. And so if you can imagine, this is actually a beeswax little worm that my child made. Uh, hopefully it won't melt today. But if you can imagine then the axis, the x axis axis here is, is energy use. And over here we have well-being with pretty modest increases from the lowest levels of energy use. We can see really dramatic increases in, in well-being. Um, the curve is grouping a little bit because of the heat, I think. But <clears throat> up in here, you start to get this saturation point, this decoupling of well-being from energy use. And then at that point, you can continue to have a rising energy levels of energy use without any corresponding um, uh, in improvement in, in human well-being, measures of human well-being. So <clears throat> a couple of things that come out of this. So first, higher levels exhibit no corresponding improvements. The benefits sort of level off. There's uh, uh, higher levels of human well-being can then potentially be achieved um, at relatively modest levels of energy use. And um, importantly, the only assured outcome of, of this increasing energy use is increasing ecological degradation, if not social inequity, meaning that at some point these advantages gained from higher energy use will be overwhelmed by social and environmental harms. So as part of this research, I um, did a systematic review of literature that was looking at this energy well-being relationship over the last 10 years. And specifically, I was in response to this, the saturation effect, I wanted to identify and compare a range of values of energy sufficiency maximums as the level of per capita energy use beyond which there's little to no associated increase in quality of life. So <clears throat> again, we're really focusing on what's happening right in, in this area. Where does that exist? So I'll, for, for today's talk, I'll focus on three outcomes that I discovered through this review. First, just conceptually, we need more clarity on what we mean by energy sufficiency. Um, so I'm defining energy sufficiency here as one, the maximum quantity of energy use, two, associated with improvements to human well-being, three, measured at the aggregate societal level, and four, as a complement to renewable energy and energy efficiency. And if there's time, we can get into each of those elements of that definition in greater detail. But <clears throat> I did want to just speak to the first point, the maximum quantity of energy use. We do have pretty broad agreement that justice requires a minimum level of energy use such that basic needs are met. But I'm arguing here and sufficiency are, suggests that justice also requires a maximum consumption levels, given these unavoidable harms of energy use, and that we need to associate that level with well-being, meaning um, the level of demand of modern energy services necessary to lead a good life, measured in, in a variety of ways, physical and subjective quality of life variables. Second point, um, in theory, so the theory of this relationship then, um, the research that I found does seem to confirm this existence or a phenomenon of a saturation point. And what's important, I think, is a conformity of views that such a level exists and the range within which this level is found. So um, I'm speaking here in terms of gigajoules per capita per year, which by itself may not mean a whole lot, but this is based on total primary energy supply at the national level. And so an energy sufficiency value that I found among this review most commonly falls between 100 and 150 gigajoules per capita per year as the point where that relationship between energy use and well-being uh, begins to weaken with a mean of around 132, so <clears throat> gigajoules per capita per year. So to put that in context, context that's double what the uh, equivalent of, of energy use for a 2000 watt society, the policy popularized in Switzerland, and it's less than half the amount presently used in the US and Canada. Um, an average world TPS in 2017 
is, was 78 gigajoules per capita, ranging from non-OECD nations around 56 gigajoules per capita up to 172 per capita for OECD nations. And in Canada, we're looking at 338 gigajoules per capita and in the United States, 284 um, in 2018. Meanwhile, we have places where you can achieve, or it's been demonstrated that high levels of average life satisfaction um, have been achieved with relatively moderate levels of energy use, such as in Mexico, Colombia, Costa Rica. With the US, meanwhile, ranking 31st in life satisfaction and 44th in uh, life expectancy at birth. <clears throat> so these factors that help explain this, that the factors that help explain this relationship are not clear. And if, and if we have time in the Q&A, we can consider some likely explanations for this relationship. So the third point then is uh, around the methods of, of, um, of monitoring this. So energy sufficiency in practice would require a lot more attention and analysis of this relationship over time. Um, in terms of measurement, we can look at both production and consumption measures of energy use. Um, TPS is a production measure. Consumption would capture more of the, uh, the dynamics around trade and embodied energy. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to ask a pause here for a moment and ask people also to put into the chat what measures of uh, well being um, people feel might be appropriate when we're considering um, this type of energy sufficiency approach. So just take a moment. How do we, how do we uh, know we're achieving well-being? Warmth, well, we've got that today here. <laughs> Being warm or cool, hours of sleep, reliability, affordability, I think that refers to energy access, water, basic needs, proper diet, health conditions. Excellent, so you can keep on with that. So within this literature set, a, much of the work focuses on the human development index for measuring well-being, um, which has its strengths, no doubt, but it falls short as a reliable measure because it has a, uh, GDP has a strong influence on, on HDI. So it's difficult to get, uh, and also in association with energy use, so it's difficult to, to see those as being uh, independent enough. Um, life expectancy at birth and infant mort mortality are pretty strong candidates. These are uh, objective indicators. The data are available. Um, there's consistency across the measures. Um, so, but I would also say that you need subjective and objective measures. So subjective well-being hasn't been looked at as much in this work, but I think it's, it's uh, valuable. Um, and obviously you also need to think about um, time series data rather than cross-sectional uh, spatial variation because you can look at a national level and have huge disparities within a nation. And then I think more fundamentally, it requires a lot more attention to what the, the drivers are, the, what, what relationship, what drives this relationship, um, both in terms of contributing and then ultimately uh, loosening or weakening that relationship. Um, this really calls to me for a lot more engagement among social science around this energy well-being relationship, particularly around policy and implementation, uh, a critical role for social scientists to engage with these practices to better understand and help define human needs and well-being for different groups and contexts, um, for scenarios to include this kind of quantitative sufficiency levels and energy sufficient ways of living. And most broadly, I'd say we need engagement with this issue of energy and well-being, at least to the level of attention now given to the relationship between energy and economic growth. So I'll just close by saying, as a summary, I'm arguing we need to establish and implement maximum energy targets for energy transition. And energy sufficiency requires alternative measures of prosperity and well-being other than high levels of energy use or its associated economic growth. Um, and demonstrated in, in this review, a variety of measures are, of well-being are available and are already in use for 
assessing and understanding this relationship. So we were also asked to consider actionable outcomes. So there are a number of policies that are available um, that could be implemented, certainly regulation, supply caps, allowances, energy descent planning, um, changes in production and consumption, use of time and work time reductions that was noted in, in some of the chats. Um, but I think more importantly, before we get to any specific policies, the framing is really critical. The most important first step uh, is likely to be to create the social and political framework for sufficiency, meaning raising awareness of this relationship between energy and well being, agreeing that ever rising energy use is not viable, articulating the need to determine and realize energy sufficiency maximums. And the point here is to acknowledge that high levels of energy use cause more harm than good and that reductions from the highest levels are desirable. So in this way, sufficiency can serve as a key organizing principle for the energy transition. And I'll leave it there. Thank you.